An overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13 through 1414. The Resurrection of the Righteous. We're still in the fifth section of the Gospel, Jesus' Journey to Death, showing messianic signs and teaching. Jesus spoke about a near future and a far future. First, giving warnings, and then a great promise. Jesus' warning. Repent or perish. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. There was a common belief that all misfortune was caused by one's bad behavior. What was Jesus talking about mixing of blood with sacrifices? The historian Flavius Josephus, who himself lived in the first century, wrote the following. Pilate undertook to bring a stream of water to Jerusalem from 25 miles away. He financed it with sacred money stolen from the temple. Several thousand Jews got together and protested against him. So Pilate disguised a great number of his soldiers in plain clothes who carried daggers under their garments and sent them to a place where they surrounded them. Hence those Galileans bled to death at the temple. Pontius Pilate was the fifth Roman prefect or governor of Judea under Emperor Tiberius. Coming back to our text, Jesus said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. What does it mean to repent? It is to turn away from former behavior and beliefs, to embrace new behavior and new beliefs. In the New Testament, this means to stop breaking God's laws and start trusting Jesus to change me. The term perish has two main meanings in Scripture. Number one, to die physically. In English we say, there was a shipwreck and all hands aboard perished. But it also means to be thrown into hell, to go into the underworld forever. Reason for which John 3.16 states, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that all who put their trust in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. This passage also talks about a four-year chronology for the work of Jesus. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I shall dig round it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, then fine. If not, then cut it down. Jesus had completed three years of work. He had been born between 4 and 1 BCE and had begun his public work in the year 29. For three years, between 29 and 32, he showed the signs of Messiah and taught many thousands. Now he's entering a fourth year, from 32 to 33. Now, Jesus had a bad habit. He often violated religious rules. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit 
for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. How do we know that this was caused by a spirit? Well, Jesus will tell us so. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Jesus violated two social standards here. One, he did the work of God on the Sabbath day, and secondly, he touched a woman in public. The Sabbath day, being the seventh day of the Jewish week, began on Friday at sunset and went through Saturday at sunset. During that time, human work was strictly limited, though not God's work. The early Christians, most of whom were Jewish or followed Jewish customs, attended synagogue on the Sabbath day and then worshipped Jesus Saturday evening. What is happening here? Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? We might ask, well, after eighteen years, could she not have waited another day? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Yes, even they violated the Sabbath in order to meet the needs of their own cattle. He called this woman a daughter of Abraham. Abraham was the ancestor to whom God had revealed his promises some 2,000 years earlier. So, the promised Messiah has come, and this daughter of Abraham will be blessed. Jesus said that Satan had kept her bound. Jesus has power to release humans from all kinds of spiritual bondage. Ask him to do so, and he will. Who were his opponents? Religious leaders are the main opponents to Jesus everywhere to this day. The people were delighted. We ordinary folk may freely experience Jesus' kindness the very day we come to him. What does it mean to be saved? Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? In Scripture, to be saved has several meanings. One is to be healed from disease. A second is to be rescued from political domination, which is what many folk were seeking. It can mean to be raised from death at the end times. All believers await this. And fourthly, to be forgiven and to receive Jesus' Holy Spirit the common experience of every Christian believer. The Narrow Door Jesus said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to do so. Once the owner of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door to us. The narrow door in ancient Middle Eastern architecture refers to a small door in a large door that was used for everyday access. 
The main door was only opened for special occasions or ceremonies, and only those who were known to the doorkeeper were allowed to enter by the narrow door. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you are from. At the time, to know someone always meant you knew many details about them. Then you will say, Well, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. Notice Jesus now applies the parable to himself. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. It is our character that matters most. So, get to know Jesus now whilst you still can. That fox. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal, Jerusalem. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. This was a common proverb at the time. Foxes were known for their destruction more than for their wily character. Herod Antipas had been appointed by Rome as tetrarch or governor, ruling over the regions of Galilee and Perea until 39 CE. It was he who beheaded John the Baptist. A prophet to die. The ancient prophets foretold Jesus' death. And Jesus himself predicted his death. When, where, and how. And afterwards, eyewitnesses reported his death. Now, we know that he died to forgive our sins and then rose back to life. There is a great religion in the world that has a book in which there is one only verse which says that they did not crucify him. Whom shall we believe? The prophets, Jesus himself, and the eyewitnesses? Or someone else who wrote 600 years afterwards? Jesus' promise. What's going on here? In this ancient painting, Jesus is depicted touching a man who is swollen with edema or dropsy. One Sabbath, notice again, Jesus chooses the Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Remember, only God can heal. So they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, Jesus healed him and sent him on his way. This poor animal has fallen into a water source. Then Jesus asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Why did they have nothing to say? They all knew that they themselves would violate the Sabbath in order to rescue the needy. Exactly what Jesus had done. The place of honor. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, 
you will have to take the least important place. Jesus often talked about how those who serve others the most will be the most honored in his coming kingdom. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, what is the difference between ascribed honor and achieved honor? Achieved honor is given to those who have performed well, whereas ascribed honor is given to those who were born well. In what ways do we show public honor in our society? With seating? With money? With awards? In what ways will Jesus show more honor to some than to others in his kingdom feast? Those who had been the humblest will be the most honored. Here generous Indians are feeding the poor and the aged. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do so, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid, and that will be the end of your pay. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. They will bless you. And although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Uh, who will repay you? Since the poor cannot. And what is resurrection? And how many resurrections are there to be? Towards a two-resurrection theory. Elsewhere, Jesus taught that an hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Resurrection is when dead folk will live again, when God will bring back to life the bodies of all who had died. When Jesus spoke of doing the good or the bad, this is as Good and bad are described by Jesus, not as they are set by human opinion or by social, cultural norms. More about two resurrections. The Apostle John saw in a vision, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years, though the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will reign with him for a thousand years. This leads us to understand that there will be a first resurrection for those who will have done the good things that Jesus prescribed and they will rise to live forever. But after a thousand years, whether taken literally or figuratively, the second resurrection will be for those who had done the evil things that Jesus condemned. They will rise to be judged and to be lost forever. So, what did you discover from this text? What truths could you affirm? What promises could you claim? What commands should you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read Luke 14.15 through 15.32 in various translations. Then visit the website for other links to more materials 
And as you do so, compile your insights, queries, and observations to share with others.